the ethic that's informed the Western world, the Judeo-Christian ethic, the ethic that's informed how we operate, is one that's important. It's one that, that has allowed human beings to flourish and civilizations to flourish. Not always successfully, take off and unsuccessfully, that's true. But it's one that gives, allows us the possibility of meaning and the possibility of at least exploring and accepting that there might be a side to ourselves that's spiritual, that seeks meaning, that spirit, seeks a relationship with God, that, streets, that seeks genuine relationships, that seeks the possibility of souls being able to touch and 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 the possibility of us giving altruistically to others. If we question and deny the possibility of genuine altruism, if we question and deny the possibility of genuine meaning, if we question and deny the possibility of moral and absolute morality, or free will, free will freely chosen, then I don't know where that leaves a human being and I don't know where that leaves society. Welcome back to Jewish Wisdom on JTV. Today we're joined by Rabbi Eliezer Zobin, who is the principal of Emmanuel College, the Jewish school in London, and also the associate rabbi of Ne Israel in, in Hendon. Not bad, I got it the first time, nice. So Rabbi, I just want to jump straight into a bunch of questions that we've been uh, given, and I have as well, that I want to talk to you about. So let's just jump into the first one, which is, Judaism appears to have a very strict one could even say conservative sexual ethic. Um, do you want to just speak a little, a little bit about why it is that Judaism prohibits things that society, and at least in Western culture, considers normal, such as premarital sex, um, and even to the extreme level of uh, not being able to touch the opposite gender? Um, that, for many people, people would consider very, very extreme. Um, uh, how, how would you frame the Jewish sexual ethic and laws? So it's a very interesting and important question because you're definitely right that this is one of the areas where Jewish ethics perhaps most clearly and transparently contradicts current Western ethics. Um, one way of thinking about ethics, and this is a, a, a way that was developed in the uh, 17 and 18 1900s, is to use the word instrumentalization. So treating other people with respect, not belittling them or demeaning them or diminishing them by seeing them merely as an instrument for your own needs. Instrumentalization, not seeing someone as a means to an end, but valuing a person as an end to themselves. Something really at the heart of, of liberal moral, the liberal moral code. And where Judaism takes this in a slightly different direction is that in the same way as instrumentalizing another is morally a problem, it also thinks that instrumentalizing yourself is morally a problem. In other words, not recognizing the full dimension of what a human being is, and what a human being can be, and the full range of what a person is capable of, mm. instrumentalizing yourself, seeing yourself mean, merely as a means for a limited aspect of yourself or for someone else, that would also be morally a problem in Judaism. So in Judaism, we view a person as complicated. A person has a physical dimension, we have an intellectual dimension, we have an emotional dimension, we have a spiritual dimension, and the full range of what a person is is the full extent of the dignity of a human being. So in the same way as it would be wrong to instrumentalize yourself and to lack self-confidence, to merely see yourself as a means for bringing pleasure to someone else or a means of serving someone else that would be diminishing your capacity as a human being and the respect that you deserve, as a human being and the respect you deserve for yourself. Similarly wrong if you instrumentalize a dimension of yourself, an aspect of yourself, and don't express yourself fully as a human being and every element of yourself. Now, the, the sexual drive and the area of sexuality in a human being is an important part of our psyche and an important part of our makeup. And therefore we have to be careful to channel it only in a way in which we're able to express ourselves fully and it fully reflects every element and dimension of what it means to be a human being. And therefore, this area, this dimension of our psyche has to be expressed in the context of a stable, loving relationship. A relationship in which there's self-respect, in which a person isn't demeaning or diminishing themselves in terms of the relationship with other people, and they're not demeaning or diminishing themselves in terms of the relationship with themselves. So this is a relationship which exists on every level. It's a relationship which exists on an intellectual level, it's a relationship that exists on an emotional level, it's a genuine partnership in terms of life plans and life visions and life directions and life goals. And therefore, the physical element of the relationship is an expression of the deeper love and the, the deeper link 
and covenant that's between the two human beings involved in this relationship. Mm -hmm. In the context of Judaism, it also means a halachic relationship. It also means that there's a halachic element of the relationship. But it's deeper than just about halacha. It's about an expression of self. It's about a, a recognition and a respect of the person on a holistic level. But what's the danger if you just engage in the physical level? And let's say, you, you know, it's, it's uh, something you're okay to be involved with, you choose to. What's, what's, the, what's the big deal? It's the person seeing themselves merely as an expression of the physical elements of themselves, rather than understanding that this is a powerful part of what a person is. So what's the consequence of that? Well, the consequence of that is that a person can come to see themselves as merely a pleasure-seeking being almost animalistic in their relationship, rather than understanding that a person is capable of a deeper level of relationship. A person is more than that. A person, yes, has an element of themselves which needs to express itself physically. And by the way, Judaism is intensely aware of that. We, we view sexual relations as something which is Kodesh Kodoshim, is the holiest of the holy. We view it as something positive and, and a, a beautiful expression of love when it's within the context of a genuinely loving relationship, a relationship in which there's the emotion of love, but there's also the commitment of love. Love. We don't just see love as a, a passing phase, but something which is a commitment and a dedication to each other. Right. But Judaism is intensely aware of the need for a person to express themselves physically. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if you think about it, the whole halachic system, the whole system of mitzvot, of commandments, of the need to take values, but then immediately express them in physical action is because it's aware of the dimension of physicality within a human being. But beyond that, it has to be an expression of something deeper than that. And if a person merely comes to see themselves as a physical being, then they're instrumentalizing themselves. They're seeing themselves as merely a means for something else, rather than the fullest and deepest expression of what the person is. Okay, I think I can understand that concept that you need to have, if you want to engage with someone physically, there needs to be an emotional or spiritual engagement, otherwise you're demeaning yourself and instrumentalizing yes. yourself. But to say that you have to wait to engage um, intimately and physically before, uh, and to only, un only after marriage, that is that not, a, I mean, you know, if you have a very deep relationship that's going on for several years, why, why should you need to wait? And it seems that not only does Jewish law say that you can't have marital relations, but it actually says you can't even touch. So how do, you, how do you explain that? Because surely you would accept that you can build deep relationship without yet being at the stage of marriage. In Jewish thinking, a deep relationship doesn't just mean the depth of emotional um, connection with each other, but it also means a commitment. And the truth is we know that emotions can come and go, and they can come and go because of trivial reasons. One can be overtired, one can be going through a stressful phase in mm. life, and one simply won't experience at that particular point emotion. Mm. Um, in Jewish thinking, True, a true relationship has to have the covenantal element to it, it has to have a level of commitment. And we refer to that commitment as marriage in the context of Judaism, that refers to a halachic marriage. But this is broader than just Judaism. This is a value and a moral and a, a spiritual truth that we believe is relevant to wider society in general, to the broad society also. There has to be a commitment, and that commitment is what we call marriage. The commitment is to engage in the work and the effort. The commitment is to give and to care and to protect each other, even in the time in which one emotion isn't necessarily engaged, for whatever reason. The commitment is to invest in, through the relationship, in building a connection that reflects one's broader values as people. It's about Isn't setting a up a home together. Say, right, so you're saying that it's not enough to say I'm committed as your boyfriend or as your girlfriend. You're saying that doesn't... There has to be a commitment to keeping the relationship going and investing it even when times get hard. And that can only difficult. be done through marriage? And that can only be done through a, a formal commitment. In the context of Judaism, that means the formal commitment of marriage. But that can only be done in the case of a formal commitment. It's, it means expressing this through a home together, in which is a holistic relationship, a relationship which isn't just about the intimate and physical aspect of the relationship, but is about building a home, a home in which one can reflect the values that you share. The context of Judaism, Jewish values, a home in which one engages in giving to the community, a home in which one has a home which one opens to welcoming guests, a home in which one expresses one physical and ethical and moral values. Therefore, the commitment that one needs is a commitment to share a life together. It's a commitment to, for the physical element of the relationship to be an expression of a deeper commitment to share a life and to go through life hand in hand as best friends, as partners who have this commitment to succeed in this relationship no matter what challenges are, are thrown at it. And you do find also a people that are um, promiscuous and that kind of engage with mm -hmm. in, in, in relations with all kinds of people, mm -hmm. they're not committed to marriage, that they do often end up feeling very empty. Um, and it, would you say this is down to the fact that they are, as you said, instrumentalizing themselves and just sort of demeaning the concept of a, a human relationship? 
It's an interesting thing because we've already said that a person exists on different dimensions, different levels. Mm. Some of these dimensions are easily accessible to us, to our consciousness, to our psyche. We're aware of them. And if one enters into a relationship in which one isn't expressing oneself on every level, at least on every level of which one's aware, one will feel a certain emptiness and sense of failure. Mm. So certainly if one's a relationship in which there's merely the physical connection and one isn't in this relationship finding expression to the parts of the psyche with, of which one's aware, the emotional element of the relationship, the psychological element of the relationship, the love and care and commitment mm. and, and friendship towards each other, then one will leave that relationship feeling empty and feeling uh, uh, sullied and feeling diminished and feeling demeaned through so doing. Judaism would also add that there's elements of the human being of which perhaps we're not always psychologically aware, mm. or perhaps we need to become psychologically attuned, and we refer to that by names, by words. We talk about the neshama, the soul, we talk about spirituality. And the truth of the matter is, if one doesn't have a halachic relationship, those elements of the relationship won't be expressed either, but one may not feel that sense of emptiness. So if one's in a loving, committed, long-term relationship without a halachic marriage, one may not be aware of the dimension of the relationship that's lacking, but there's parts of the human being which we believe aren't automatically or easily accessible to the conscious, right. and that's one has to become attuned to. Right. So just last question on this, on this yeah. topic. Shomer Nagir, not being able to touch the opposite gender, a bit much? I understand it's a difficult area, and it's certainly counter, very counter to the culture. Um, again, it comes from the respect that Judaism pays towards two important parts of, of life. It's very, very conscious of the power of sexuality and the idea that touch between uh, people is, is a powerful tool to relationship and a physical expression of that relationship, and itself uh, engenders uh, uh, a tension and a sexual tension sometimes between people. Mm -hmm. And it's also, again, the respect that Judaism pays towards the the importance of respecting someone and not uh, instrumentalizing them, seeing them for the person they are and understanding the nature of the relationship that exists between the two people, and therefore touch in the context of, uh, of or expression of warmth in relationship is inappropriate. Uh, Sometimes people feel disrespected. They're like, what, you won't shake my hand? You won't give me a hug? This, you know? That's absolutely true, and this is a, a, a reminder and a wake-up call to us as Orthodox Jews. So perhaps we, we need to explain better our, our message and our values, and on an individual and personal level, ensure that when we're dealing with people that they're able to understand, we're able to communicate and express properly and correctly and appropriately that this is actually coming from a set of values that we have, which are meant to empower a human being rather than, than diminish them. But yes, I do accept that this is something, uh, sometimes something difficult. And um, I, I would point out on a halachic level, uh, touch, which isn't an expression of a relationship, is allowed. Um, Every person needs to consult their competent halakhic authority about uh, a handshake, for example, and whether this is a, a formal expression of, of touch and contact. But uh, yes, it's, it's certainly a challenge, it's a difficult thing. So, the next question is this. The Torah, there's no doubt, has seriously impacted the world's value system, at least in Western culture, but you could say, you know, values such as the dignity of human life, um, you know, the importance of the family, um, ethical monotheism, you know, these values are really key pillars to so many people's lives. The majority of the world is probably believes in the God of Abraham. But the question that I want to ask on this is actually, can the world's values actually ever impact our own Jewish values and Jewish legal system? And does and how can Jewish law adapt to societal change? This is a very, a very, also a very good question, a very interesting one. I think it can be answered on, on two levels. It can be answered on a, on a more pragmatic level and then it can be answered on a more, on a deeper, more profound philosophical level. On a pragmatic level, Halacha is always based on the circumstances. And therefore, as society changes, um, Halacha will reflect that societal change in how it assesses and deals with a situation. So this can be as simple and as trivial as um, the laws of bracha, making a blessing, expressing appreciation on eating food, in which uh, um, as dietary habits change, the way Halacha expresses itself in the way the bracha that's appropriate to make, the blessing that's appropriate to make on a particular food can alter, so it can be something very, very trivial, or as significant as the role of women within society. Um, so, for example, there's a Gemara that speaks about uh, on Pesach, on Seder night, we lean, and we lean in order to express our, uh, 
our uh, sense of freedom and our sense of dignity in leaving, e in, in leaving the slavery of Egypt and expressing our sense of being free people. And the Gemara says that uh, a woman doesn't lean on Seder night because Eimat ba leo leo, the awe or fear of a husband is on her. This is what the Gemara says. And uh, the Poskim already from the uh, medieval era and onwards, or the Gemara already actually, going back to the time of the Gemara, the Gemara says that if she is an Isha Chashuvah, if she is an important woman, then she can lean, because she won't have a Matba Leo Leo. She won't be someone who is in awe or perhaps a phrase of her husband. Yeah, now it's the other way around. It's the husband has the fear of the <laughs> And the Poskim already say that uh, nowadays, uh, the Poskim already from the medieval era, the halakhic authorities already from the medieval era, comment that uh, nowadays all women can lean at the Seder. Yeah. And the reason they say this is because Noshim Didon, our women are Chashuvahs, they're all important and they're all uh, a situation which they're entitled to uh, uh, lean. So are, these are these values changing? Or so Ramosha Feinstein, who, is, uh, who was perhaps the most prominent halakhic authority of the latter half of the 20th century in America, he comments that what's happening over here is the Gemara isn't expressing a value. The Gemara isn't saying it's a good thing or a bad thing that Eimat Baalei Oleo. The Gemara is simply reflecting society at the time. And it's simply saying this is the Metziot, this is the fact, this is the way the circumstances are. And therefore, she wouldn't be comfortable to lean. It wouldn't be an appropriate expression of freedom for her to lean. Mm -hmm. Society shifts and had already shifted by the medieval era. And now she would feel comfortable to lean and therefore halacha will change to reflect that. So this can be on a very trivial and basic level. Um, as we said, in the laws of blessings or the laws of the leaning on Seder night. But where you get to a more profound discussion is the whole area of enhanced sensitivity towards morals and, and values which perhaps Western society or modern society has and perhaps which uh, didn't exist in the past. And here you get to somewhat of a controversy in in Jewish thinking, and perhaps the divide between perhaps the way the Kabbalists might look at things and how Rambam, Maimonides, might look at things. And the Rambam, certainly in his Guide to the Perplexed, in his Moen of Uchim, seems to have been aware, uh, acutely aware, and discusses the idea of uh, moral and sensitivities, moral sensibilities, ethical sensibilities, and the idea that perhaps we can have a change and a generational shift in which perhaps we become more aware of such things as time moves on. And perhaps sometimes, ironically, as the values of the Torah themselves become more integrated into society, we're allowed and able to have enhanced moral sensibilities that perhaps we wouldn't have had in the past, something that Rabbi Sachs also speaks about in various of his works. So, for example, if we look at the issue of slavery in the Torah, um, and we reflect on how we apply that nowadays. So you have two broad approaches to how you might address this. And the problem is, of course, that the Torah does allow slavery to exist. It's, uh, it's uh, something that the Torah recognizes and gives legal acknowledgement to. And has a very... In similar forms to the way it was practiced, say, you know, in America? In or... a very different form, and that's the point. The Torah form. accepts the phenomenon of slavery, acknowledges it, and then builds a very, very tight system of protection around it. Mm -hmm. So it builds a set of values in which a master certainly wouldn't be allowed to inflict physical pain on the slave, which a master certainly would need to reflect, respect the life of the slave. In fact, the killing of a slave would be treated as murder in halacha, in the, in the Torah system. This wouldn't be something that would be trivialized. So the Torah takes a, a, the idea of slavery, something that we're not necessarily comfortable with at all, it accepts it, and yet it builds a very tight system of protection around it, a very, very specific and tight system of protection. Nonetheless, it does acknowledge and allow its existence. And here we need to ask ourselves, how do we live with that in the 21st century when this is certainly a value that's unacceptable? Mm. So here there's two ways of looking at the system. You could say the Torah is reflecting intrinsic existential values that therefore need to exist for, two, for all time. And if we in the Western world aren't comfortable with the idea, we've clearly got something wrong. Perhaps there are people for whom, as a temporary step, reflecting the economic circumstances or their education or their environment, this is the best they can achieve at this difficult stage in their lives, and therefore this is an appropriate way for society to function. Or we can say perhaps the Torah is a reluctant accommodation to the reality as it existed then. And, and as society changes. And yeah. therefore, as society changes, it's something that we can certainly move on in the sensitivity. So if we move back to the economy as it existed three and a half thousand years ago, it may be in that economic climate it wasn't feasible to dismiss slavery as a phenomenon of society completely. It was just something that was necessary. Perhaps even there was something positive in Jews being allowed to engage in slavery. If the whole of society and the whole of the world had slaves, then perhaps it was a good thing for Jews to be able to buy slaves and give them an enhanced protection in their life mm. that they wouldn't have had had Jews not been able to engage in slavery. But this certainly, in this way of thinking, wouldn't be an ideal. This would be a reluctant accommodation to the values at the time, to the values as they existed. But if we are now able to live in a society in which we economically don't need slavery, and indeed we have the sensitivity to realize what a travesty this is of the value of human life, 
then maybe indeed this would be something that wouldn't be appropriate for us to have. And this is certainly an approach that the Rambam and uh, those that follow that system of thought so, would take. So what you're saying is that the values of the world can change by and large through Torah concepts uh, having greater influence in the world. And as society's you know, methods of doing things changes, then Jewish law can uh, sort of re change the way it accommodates certain, certain realities and certain... That's values. correct. In other words, if you build a society in which there's constant emphasis on the value of human life, so we speak again and again about, remember, you were slaves in Egypt. And therefore, this is meant to change the nature of what sort of person you are, how you view yourself. If we think about the founding story we tell about ourselves as Jews, we talk about Yitziat Mitzrayim, the exodus of, out of Egypt. If we talk about what a Jew is, a Jew is an ex-slave. That's what it means to be a Jew. A Jew is a freed slave. We're not nice, middle-class, suburban person living in the leafy environs of Golders Green and Hansen. Right. We're Jews. We're ex-slaves. Ex-slaves, what sort of people are we? That means we're people who are poorly educated. Slaves don't necessarily have the best standards of hygiene. Slavery can affect the morality of the slave. We can become self-centered and selfish. And we're meant to remember that's what we are. What, what does it mean to be a Jew? To be a Jew means to be an ex-slave. So if you inculcate a society with these values, and the Torah says again and again, perhaps 30, 40 times in the Torah, remember that you were slaves who left Egypt and therefore look after the weak and the vulnerable in society. We'll look after the orphans and the widows and those who are needy. Look after the stranger that lives in your gate. If we have these values deep-rooted within our souls, if we build a system for protection, even in the area of slavery for the slaves that we're dealing with, at some point or other in society, society, we're going to shift our mind view, something's going to go click. At some point in our lives, we're going to realize that these are other human beings that we're dealing with. We're dealing with humans, and at that point, we're going to express a revulsion of the whole concept of slavery. And therefore, this is going to introduce, the Torah is introducing in this way of thinking, a gradual process, a slow process, which will lead eventually to a society that's able to rid itself of slavery. So, so society over time will shift towards a sensitivity and awareness of these values, which will lead to a society that's eventually able to cope without slavery at all. Right. And this idea is expressed already in the Gemara, so this isn't an innovative idea. The Rambam and others would find sources from this, from the Talmud itself, from the Gemara itself. The sages of the Talmud itself comment on various mitzvahs, which they themselves question the ethics and morality of this particular halakha. And they said, Lo dibra Torah elok neged The Torah here was reluctantly accommodating the negative aspect of society, the negative aspect of human beings, and it was trying to accommodate and shift and create a transition in values in the area. Lodibra Torah Eloka Negad The Torah was saying, this is how the human psyche is. This is where society is up to at the moment. And therefore we're going to But that doesn't necessarily create... mean progress. That doesn't necessarily mean that the, rabbi, the, 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 the sages of the Talmud are saying, we, the Torah wants us to progress away from this point to, to the stage where we don't have that negative urge. You could, it could just be saying, we will always have this negative urge, and therefore... It's the true, you don't see in that a source for progress, but you do see in that a source for the idea that the Torah sometimes will reluctantly accommodate features of the human makeup and the human psyche, rather than being as idealistic as we would perhaps like it Fine. to be, in which it would only have things of the highest ethical right. or moral standards. In other words, the Torah is a pragmatic document also. It's a pragmatic legal system. Mm. It's a legal system that recognizes human foibles and human nature and human weaknesses, and will sometimes accommodate them. Which means to say, it's not against the thinking of the Talmud to suggest that there could be situations in which we can move on. It, it, the halachic system recognizes the idea of khumra, the idea of stringency or going beyond the letter of the law. It recognizes the idea of hidur, of, of us as human beings creating a beautification of the halachic and legal system. And therefore I would suggest that we could view this as an area in which we are able as a society now to be machme, to go beyond the basic rock bottom level that halacha sets. Right. And therefore we are able to exist and move right. beyond the idea of slavery, having taken and integrated within ourselves the values that the Torah wishes to put. Right. Uh, to put forward. Right. Now, if we go according to that paradigm, then there seems to me to be a very obvious danger, which is that we could be in any society and we could say that, oh, society does this, or they have this value, and you could make the argument that it's rooted in Torah principles and it's been influenced by Torah values, and actually it hasn't. And people, for whatever reason, whether it's with an uh, insincere or sincere motivation, will say, let's take on that value, or we should adapt our laws to incorporate that value. Um, and you could end up creating a Jewish legal system which actually doesn't reflect the Jewish values, class. which is seemingly very, very, very dangerous. So how can you know what is and isn't derived from Jewish values? 
So this is also very important and an interesting question. I, I think there's a few points to be said on this. The first point is we're talking, we're not over here talking about using values to allow that which the Torah prohibits. There's no particular mitzvah in the Torah which says thou shalt owe slaves. There's simply a set of halachas that if you do owe a slave, this is a way to behave. Mm. So the halachic system still has very, very clearly deline delineated lines in the sand, right. limits, parameters, which shifting values aren't going to allow to shift. So I think this is the first uh, point to make. In a way, actually, here we're talking about being more stringent than the halachic system demands. Mm. We're saying the halachic system allows slavery within certain parameters, and we're saying we no longer feel comfortable, we no longer feel that this is spiritually appropriate or ethically or morally right. appropriate for us to do. Right. So I think this is the first point to be made. The second point to be made is that when societal values shift, and perhaps feminism is a good example of this, it takes the halachic system a fair amount of time to adapt to that and to address it and to deal with it. And this can sometimes be a source of frustration, considerable frustration, because when I say a fair amount of time, it can mean decades or generations. And during this time, the halachists are trying to trash out the issue, they're trying to address the issue, they're trying to deal with it, and they're trying to see how halacha can and cannot respond to it. This can again be on something very technical, very pragmatic. Um, when electricity first uh, became a, a, a common phenomenon, something that was around in society, it took halachas perhaps 100 years of conversation to address it, to deal with it. How exactly do we deal with electricity on Shabbat, on Yom Tov, in areas of other uh, mitzvot, in areas in which we as human beings need to produce things, matzot and other such matters. So it takes the halachic system a long time to address machinery, to address electricity, to address modern phenomena. Sometimes things are dealt with more swiftly when there's a particularly pressing need. For example, some of the uh, innovations in, in genetic uh, um, medical care, in fertility treatments, halacha will deal with it fairly quickly. But what will happen is, as in any other area of human achievement, any other area of human wisdom, um, the experts will debate, and there'll be controversy, and there'll be discussion, and opinions will be put forward, and they'll go to peer review, in which other scholars in the generation discuss these ideas. Mm. And it can take the halachic system time to deal with it, there's other reasons why it can take the halachic system time to deal with it, because halacha is fundamentally a conversation across the generations. And halacha therefore needs to take time till it's able to address a particular topic. There can't be a sense of rupture within tradition. Things can take time for, for Judaism. And Judaism, don't forget, isn't just a legal system. It's a societal system. It's a cultural system. It's a way of being. It's a way of living. And it can take time for any society to adjust to these new circumstances. Now, the fact that halacha can take time to adjust is a challenge sometimes because it can leave people frustrated in the meantime, but it's also a great strength because it gives us time to pause, to reflect, to think about the implications, to consider, is this just a passing phase in human morality? Is this just a passing phase of modernity and something that's in fashion today and going to be out of fashion tomorrow? Or does this indeed reflect a deeper, more integral value? And I think this is part of the reason why, why as a society, and why halakha itself has a system, a very rigorous process of dealing with these issues. It's not just willy-nilly a new value comes online and therefore we're able to change it and uh, uh, change how we deal with it. It's something that has to be worked through a very, very rigorous process, a process in which experts look and consider the, the sources. And here I'm picking my my examples very carefully. There aren't easy examples necessarily to come up with in which we can see where society, over, where, where halachists over time have accepted a change in societal values and the halachic system has integrated it. How long this is it a take? process. How long will it take for a change in the halachic system to occur? As I said, I think it, it depends on the, on the nature of the halacha and how, uh, how difficult the topic is. Mm. Difficult topics can take longer. They can be difficult because of the halachic nature of the topic and difficult because of the societal change and shift in this. But halacha, we do see, adapts to, to changed values and, and different circumstances. I think also one needs to look at the nature of the values that we're expressing and see if at core they reflect Jewish values and halachic values themselves. Very difficult to do. Very difficult to do. But for example, if we look at the area of slavery, we see the impetus and the core value behind our sensitivity towards us and our discomfort with the idea of slavery is something rooted in Torah values, the respect for all human lives, the respect for the dignity of a human being. The Torah itself, the Talmud itself tells us, why is it that we speak about Loman Nivra Adam Yechidi? Why do we talk about man, the first man, the first human being, being created alone? Why don't we ascribe human existence to a multiplicity of Ancestry. Why is it that the Torah teaches us that God created one human being from whom all human beings come? And the, Torah tell, the Talmud answers, gives several answers, the Mishnah gives several answers to this question. One answer gives, 
is a very interesting answer. It says that uh, it teaches us that anyone who saves a single human life is like someone who saves a whole world, because the whole vast world that we see in front of us stems from one human being. But another answer that Talmud gives is so that no one person can turn to someone else and say, my ancestor was greater than your ancestor, because all of us descend from one human being. Mm. So we see that at heart, these are values which stem from the Torah itself. Mm. These are values which are acknowledged by the Torah, values that are acknowledged by the Alakic system, and therefore, Perhaps these are ones which the halachic system is able to integrate into itself. Can you? I feel like people people are able to construe arguments to justify almost any societal value and say that the Torah should adjust to it. You know, um, for example, in the role of you know, you talk about feminism now. The the question of differences of gender in Jewish law is obviously a very big topic. Um, there's many different opinions on the matter. Um, how would you be able to decipher what is something that Jewish uh, law can uh, endorse or adapt to and not? Because I feel like you could, you know, you really could, ju you could almost justify anything. So how do we decide it? Is it based on consensus? Um, because it doesn't always seem to be the case. There seem to be some people that differ and they are okay with differing within the halachic system. So a very interesting question, an important one. I'd like to make two points about it. The first point is that just because something is dangerous or just because something can be misunderstood or just because something is difficult to apply doesn't make it untrue. And it's certainly true that the model we're talking about within Alakha is dangerous and sensitive and difficult to apply, but it doesn't make it untrue. And, and actually, I would argue, just going back to the idea I was expressing, that, that perhaps one of the privileges of being a Jew and the privileges of trying to live a halachic life is that we are engaged in constant conversation between the modern world and the classic world of halacha. And if you think about it, if you want to live as a reflective human being, it's so important to have that conversation going on. Because otherwise we just drift through life, living within the society within which we live, and never perhaps having the chance to question and step out of it and look at some of its values and ask ourselves. And if you ask me when I, I work as a teacher, I work in a school, when I ask myself, what are the gifts that I'm trying through teaching Jewish studies to students, trying to offer as teenagers, what I most want to give them, part of what I most want to give them, and part of the great privilege of being a Jewish teenager is that you're trying to balance these two cultures, these two worlds. You're trying to live, you're living within the modern world, and yet you're forced to question the values of the modern world. You're forced sometimes to step out of it and reflect on these values. What am I taking for granted? What are actually values that I believe and what do I believe just because everyone else is doing it? To be a Jew is to be someone who's engaged in conversation across the generations. It's to be engaged in a classic tradition. It's to be engaged in conversation with the great prophets that lived 3,000, 3,500 years ago. It's to be engaged in conversation to enter the Beit HaMedrash of the great Talmudic figures, Rabbi Kiva and Rabbi Shmuel, Abai and Rava. The Talmud is written as a conversation. It's written as a a, a, a debate between rabbis and between students and between scholars that takes place in the Beit HaMedrash and similar debates still take place to this day. When you learn Talmud, you're entering a conversation, you're becoming part of a conversation. And to be part of a conversation is the greatest privilege in the world. So to be forced to question, to be forced to balance, to look at a tradition, to be able to engage in conversation with the great classic thinkers of the Jewish past, of the halachic past, and to use that as a means to bounce off modern values and current values against the classic tradition, to me that's the greatest privilege that's possible to exist but, in the world. That's something phenomenal. But how do you determine what is a legitimate opinion, and you say, oh, I agree with that, or I disagree with that, and a, a legitimate path for Jewish law, and something which is beyond the pale, which you say, no, you're, you've taken to incorporate the societal values too far. It's, that doesn't reflect Jewish values. How, how do you d determine what is and what isn't? It's acceptable? hard to give a general answer to this question without getting into nitty-gritty, but let's take, let's take the example of feminism that you mentioned before. Yeah. And let's just do a little bit of thinking about that. So the first question we'd ask ourselves is, does feminism reflect values which are at heart, values that we care about as Jews, values which are reflected within the Torah and expressions of Torah itself? And I think the answer to that is probably nuanced. Probably a difficult question to answer. Certainly many of the values that are expressed in feminism absolutely do come from, from values that we would recognize within Torah and within Halacha. Respect for human beings, respect for the dignity of every human being. Ramosha Feinstein himself, I mentioned before, important halachic, classic uh, halachic authority of the late uh, 20th century, speaks in the context of this discussion we had about the changing role of women. He speaks about this sometimes not being a changing nature of women, but actually changing nature of men and being able to recognize the value and dignity of women, of all human beings. So the core value there, very much a Torah value. Some of the elements of feminism, some of the elements of that development within society, perhaps come from values which aren't Torah values. Um, it's very hard to justify in Torah, or even in actually philosophically speaking, 
um, the idea of a complete egalitarianism, the idea that uh, when we talk about, we often use phrases, we talk about all human beings being equal, but then we ask ourselves, what do we mean when we say that all human beings are equal? Do we mean that they all have equality of opportunity? Do we mean they're literally equal? Well, clearly not, no matter what we do in society, well, we different human beings. That, maybe. Would we want to aim for a society in which all human beings have absolute equality of opportunity? Is that possible? Is it possible for all human beings to have an identical IQ, to have an identical charisma, to have an identical appearance, to have identical opportunities in life? Without us making an extreme communist society, would people have identical financial opportunities, so identical family opportunities? As much as you can. So when we talk about equality as being an ideal, perhaps there's something about the makeup of the world which suggests that this just isn't how the world is, this isn't the way it is. If we talk about equality of outcome, well, here it depends how we define outcome, and this is the interesting point. If we define outcome as having equal wealth, equal life experiences, again, what sort of state would that make in society? We clearly need to balance equality with other values that we hold precious within society. We hold precious within society family, we hold precious within society liberal democracy, we hold precious within society the property rights and the idea that people can earn and therefore inevitably have different in their financial um, and economic stability in life and our financial opportunities. So clearly there are differences in even inequality of outcome. And then we need to ask ourselves what outcome is important to us as a society. So here, if we ask that in the context of Judaism, we will say self-development as a human being, ability to be a spiritual, emotionally, psychologically fulfilled person, ability to have a deep and meaningful relationship with God. And if we ask ourselves in that sense, is Judaism equal? Absolutely it's equal. The highest spiritual level a person can achieve, the idea of being a prophet, someone who's able to communicate directly, here to hear God's voice in the universe, to hear God's voice in the world. What else could it mean than that? How else could a human being be higher than that? Mm. And that's something that's absolutely accessible to men and women. So we need in every situation to think through the value of equality as a value itself and how do we define the outcome that we're looking at. And if we define the outcome as ability to operate financially, ability to operate in the public sphere, Maybe we're not an egalitarian society. If we define the outcome like that, which matters to us as Orthodox Jews, then yes, we are. We are. We do value equality. Well, my question is, who decides? Do you have to make your own judgment as to whether this is beyond the pale or not, or do you? Or is there? Is it based on consensus? How does it work within the legal framework of what is acceptable and what is not acceptable changes and movements in halacha? So I think there's two elements to this answer. The first element is that, like any other sphere of human expertise. One does need to consult the experts. And um, again, perhaps in a society in which we value autonomy as very high up the scale of values, very quite near the top of the pyramid of things that matter to us, we're sometimes uncomfortable with the idea that halacha demands of us to consult a posik, to consult a halacha authority, to consult a rabbi. But the truth is, it's no different to any other area of expertise. And in exactly the same way as uh, you would consult an expert doctor if there's a medical challenge or a scientist if there's a scientific challenge, yes, the halachic system says they're experts on halacha. It's a technical area as much as any other technical area of human wisdom and human insight. And therefore, one would need to consult a technical expert, one certainly one's dealing with cutting edge halachic issues. But you can find a rabbi that will tell you what you want to hear eventually, you know. In the same way I would suggest as you can find a doctor who will tell you that which you want to hear. You need to, in exactly the same way as you decide to choose a doctor, you need to choose a rabbi. You need to see, choose someone who's recognized and respected by his peers. Mm -hmm. Someone who has passed certain qualifications that are needed. Someone who is willing to engage in conversation, peer review conversation with other scholars and other experts of his time and see whether this is someone who's respected by their peers, someone who has that genuinely that level of expertise and that level of insight. There isn't a formal system within any field necessarily of identifying as long as someone has passed yes. their basic professional uh, qualifications. Yeah. But in the same way as there can be outlying views in the medical profession, which people perhaps uh, would have medical qualifications and still argue that certain consensus within medicine is, is, uh, is wrong. Um, and generally speaking, we will condemn these people to the, the, the realm of conspiracy theorists and rule out what they say. On rare occasion, they may indeed be groundbreaking thinkers who indeed have original insight. But generally speaking, uh, we would assume that these are people who are lacking expertise if the consensus of their peers believe so. Similarly, in this area over here, one needs to consult experts who, uh, um, who are qualified to, to pass judgment in so, their, in their so lives. So if you were living in the time of Maimonides, the Rambam, mm -hmm. who was, I think, I believe he was ostracized at one point, mm -hmm. Uh, excommunicated, would you say this guy's a quack at the time and not follow him? There's several points about the Rambam. The Rambam did raise discomfort and some of the ideas he expressed promoted a lot of controversy in his time. But he's not the only one. On the other hand, the Rambam was also an acknowledged expert in Torah and no one ever denied that. Right. So the Rambam wrote works which were phenomenal by any measure. 
So his Mishnah Torah, his classic, classic halakhic work, his commentary on the Mishnahis. These were works that at a young age led to the Rambam becoming recognized as the outstanding or an outstanding scholar of his times, of his generation. He also wrote certain philosophical works which indeed raised controversy and created upset. But this is the point over here. The Rambam was clearly qualified and recognized even by his contemporaries and certainly by time that followed as someone who was qualified to say and pass judgment about halacha and about areas of Jewish insight. And yes, some of the ideas he said created a lot of upset and, and discreet amongst the, amongst the people at his time. But the Rambam certainly crossed the threshold of being a, a great thinker and great halachist and universally recognized as such. Um, so I think this is the first point that needs to be said in terms of... of uh, how one goes about making a decision. The second point uh, to, to be aware of is that the sages of the Talmud, Chazal, had an almost post-modern relationship to the truths of Torah, in which they understood that Torah being given to human beings means it's a two-way communication, a two-way conversation. And I'll tell you something interesting. When one engages in conversation and speech, we think of the speaker as being the source of the speech that's being said, the communication that's being said. Because of course the speaker is the person making the sounds and saying it. However, in truth, the listener is an equal partner in that conversation. Because if someone is speaking, but no one can understand and no one can listen, no one can hear and understand and comprehend what they're saying, then this isn't speech, this isn't communication, it's simply sounds. And we believe, therefore, we are partners with Hashem in hearing the Torah, almost in creating the Torah that exists. Yeah. Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu, God speaking, needs us as the Jewish people to hear and to listen mm. for this indeed to become words of Torah. Mm. And for that reason, the sages of the Talmud spoke about 70 faces to the Torah, Shivim Ponim the Torah. They spoke about Eilu Eilu Devilikim Chaim, two different viewpoints, both being the words of the living God. And therefore, in us listening to those who are qualified, and I'll speak in a moment about qualified, those who are qualified to hear the word of God, through human beings hearing the word of God, we are ourselves creating the Torah and we are understanding those words. But one has to be qualified to hear the word of God, and this is the other side of it. One has to be technically qualified. One has to be able to tap into the tradition, to work through what the tradition has to say. Just because there's 70 voices to the Torah, 70 perspectives, doesn't mean that there's a 71st or 72nd, 70 seconds. No, I guess there has that, to be genuine... I can't be the 71st, then. <laughs> there has to be genuine hearing and understanding of what the Torah has to say. So as a minimum, the people who are voicing opinions have to be able to learn through the tradition. Mm -hmm. And very often, sadly, one hears people expressing opinions, people who can't necessarily work their way through, well through a page of Talmud or through a lengthy response of the Rashba, and perhaps not so people who are able to tap into the tradition, therefore they don't have the right to express a voice or to hear an opinion of what the Torah has to say, so obviously not on a halakhic or profound philosophical level, because they aren't people who are able to engage in that and conversation. And what happens when they are very learned and they say things which are causing a lot of upset, or people, many people think are unacceptable. Again, as I said, um, even people who are qualified can sometimes take a viewpoint which, by the consensus of their peers, isn't considered uh, right. correct. And then, again, one would have to... Look, even the greatest halachic decisors, a great figure like Ramosha Feinstein, a figure like the Ramman Maimonides, not everything they said became accepted by... Right. Uh, by, by, by society, right. not everything they said became accepted by their peers. We speak about Ramosha Feinstein as being a great halachic figure because perhaps 70% of his chavah, 70% of his sponsor became classic, became normative in halacha. But even right. then, in, in Judaism is ultimately democratic amongst those who are, are qualified to pass judgment. Right. And uh, even in areas in which uh, a great halachic figure expresses a viewpoint, the consensus may arise not like them. There won't arise controversy over this viewpoint because this is someone who is widely considered competent to express an opinion. Mm. And even when their opinion doesn't become the consensus, not mistaken over a stupid or elementary point. Simply not a judgment call that's accepted. If you see a greater figure, even someone who is on paper qualified, who makes mistakes which are even on paper not justified, simply mistranslations, misreading of sources, then there will be a uh, uh, controversy is and upset with what they're saying. Is it legitimate to follow a rabbi who the, the consensus, his peers don't, don't agree with, but is a, a, learned, a learned man? Is, is that a legitimate thing to do? You need to say, well, he's my rabbi, you know. He's just one opinion. The, cons the, the, other, the other people don't agree with, he's in the minority, but I want to follow this rabbi. If peers and the majority or almost all of the scholarly world disagree with someone, that ought to give one pause for thought. Mm. To question why is it that everyone is disagreeing with this person. And at the end of the day, human beings are human beings. People can be on paper qualified and yet lack good judgment 
People can have all sorts of bias that can corrupt and twist and distort their ability to make reasoned decisions. And therefore, certainly someone who isn't an expert in the field, exactly in the same way as in medicine, would be wise to go to someone who's respected within their field. It's the same in halacha. It's wise to go to someone who is respected within their field. Right. Um, now, this doesn't mean to say that everyone just has to follow the consensus and there isn't room for conversation. There have been great figures in history. You mentioned the Rambam and many others, Rav Cook, Rav Hirsch, etc., who took on minority opinions. Um, but were still widely respected by their peers, right. even whilst they disagreed with them. Right. So they're certainly... So they're seen as legitimate opinion. They're seen as a legitimate opinion, albeit a minority one. Right. And there's certainly room in Judaism for many, many voices, and there right. continues to be room in Judaism for many, many voices. And it's an interesting thing, because you can see two different figures, both of whom express ideas which don't go with the majority or don't go with the consensus, and superficially appear to be saying very similar things. Right. And yet one will be accepted within the halachic system or within orthodoxy, and the other will be rejected. And the reason one will be accepted and the other will be rejected often comes down to simply technical issues of expertise. One of them is expressing a view that just isn't justified within the tradition. Right. And it may be difficult for the lamer person or the person who isn't qualified to see the difference. And the other one, people can radically disagree with them and there can be vigorous debates with everything they're expressing, but people recognize that this person is entitled to express a view. Yeah. Because they're simply qualified to express an opinion. Yeah. These people are great experts in the field who have genuinely, uh, in, a genuine ability to engage in conversation with the tradition, with the sources, genuinely able to come up with profound insights of Torah and Torah truths, speak to the modern world and engage with it. And therefore their view is accepted as right. a minority opinion, but one which they're entitled to say, and this is right. an important point. So, so, so just to end this, this question, which we've kind of really fleshed out, Yes. Just going all the way back to the beginning now, we, you've say, said that it is possible that um, Jewish values can impact society, society can change, and then Jewish law can, can respond and adapt. You said there's also another train of thought which says that Jewish law and Jewish values remain the same. Um, can you just present that opinion just so it, it's clear what that opinion is and how that works? Let me just tweak first of all how you phrase your question and then I'll, I'll, I'll try and address it. Um, I think all approaches to Judaism, at least those of which I'm aware, would agree that halacha, of course, adapts to changing circumstances. Halacha is all about applying the core principles to the situation as it is in front of us, and therefore, of course, if in the modern world the situation has changed, how halacha deals with it will also differ. The more controversial element of this is whether there can be some change to the values that are brought to bear on the halachic system itself. Not just how halacha is applied, but the actual system itself, the values and the legal system itself. And here the Rambam, within very tight parameters, would think that these values can change. The tight parameters are both that they have to be true to the halakhic system in terms of their application, and that the core values have to be at heart Torah values. Mm. Values which are integral to how the Torah sees the world, albeit values which perhaps have shifted over the time in our ability to integrate them to society and to how we operate. Mm -hmm. This is perhaps, and I say this tensively because I'm not an expert on the subject, perhaps in contrast to the more Kabbalistic approach, which sees the values of Torah as more existential, more intrinsic, more, and therefore perhaps harder for them to shift or perhaps unshiftable in terms of the essence of the spiritual truths that they express. You are a principal of a school. You live in London. We live in a largely secular culture, and much of secular culture emphasizes uh, materialism, and there's a worldview emerging, whether you like to call it atheism or materialism, that basically says there really isn't much beyond our physical world and physical existence. What in your mind as a rabbi, and someone that believes there is something beyond uh, physicality. What do you think are the dangers of having this sort of materialist, secular uh, philosophy, both what uh, you might sort of see with some students and also just in society at large? Also an important question, and I, I should stress that I'm answering here purely in a personal capacity. And actually, I'm not just going to answer it as a rabbi, I'm also going to answer it as a, a human being. I think you're right that in terms of as a religious believer and as someone who wants to share, passionately wants to share, the insight and beauty that I find in, in my spiritual and religious life as a Jew with the students. I think this is a massive challenge. Um, I think our students genuinely struggle. And actually, I'm saying our students, but if I'm honest, myself and all of us, 
genuinely struggle with spirituality nowadays. We, we, for actually good reasons, due to the success of science and the materialistic philosophy, the, the insight we've managed to achieve in the world by that which is measurable and, and can be seen and experimented on in the lab and, and, and is mathematically graspable, the, the incredible insight that has offered has made us suspicious of any other sources of knowledge and the ability to access anything outside that. And this perhaps comes from, from hundreds of years of, of, of um, very often pseudo-scientific theories that were spouted so in the medieval period and earlier. And as a society, we've, we've shifted towards perhaps only seeing that which is material as having reality. And as a result, we find spirituality difficult to grasp. Many of us struggle to believe, not because we lack philosophical proofs or, or other such things, but just because the whole God theory sounds so outrageous and ridiculous and just somehow quaintly old-fashioned and, and non-realistic that we, we, we just find ourselves struggling to see it as something possible that, that can exist in the real world within which we exist. So, so this is something, a very real phenomena, and, and something that, if we're honest, I think we all, we all struggle with. We're all somehow a little bit uncomfortable with the idea, something a bit unfashionable about it. What are the consequences of this? So certainly consequences are dramatic if you're speaking as a, as a believer, as someone who believes in God and someone who thinks that religion and spirituality is very central and important to human existence. But I would argue that the consequences are, are, are devastating and gutting in terms of their ability to function as human beings and, and actually alarm me, make me worry about the viability of society continuing in the way it does. Because along with the skepticism we have about belief in God, I think goes a skepticism about belief in ourselves. If you take materialism to its extreme, it often comes to the question of the concept of free will, the concept of our ability as human beings to make moral choices. If we think materialistic about ourselves, the motto are we were simply biomass, biological machines. We're robots, pre-programmed, complex algorithms that control how we operate. We're actually simply glorified fridges and freezers. We're just simply obeying the rules of science. And if we can't make choices and we can't choose freely, then what does that tell us about ourselves and what sort of beings we are? We question abs actually anything abstract and anything absolute. Perhaps we question the idea of absolute morality. We somehow shift into the only way to justify morality, some sort of social contract. If I'm not nice to you, then you won't be nice to me. And if you're not nice to me, I won't be nice to you. So it's utilitarian. It's just a practical way to live. Mm. But if as a society, we, we, we go down this path of materialism, we end up with this devastating nihilistic philosophy that denies the possibility of anything that's really meaningful in life to us as human beings. If we can't make free choices, then what does this mean about our possibility of having relationships, our possibility of sustaining something that's meaningful, our possibility of achieving anything that's really worthwhile, our possibility of being free-willed moral agents? And if we question that, and if we're in denial about ourselves as free-willed moral agents, then we're denying a whole part of the human psyche that's part of ourselves that understands and that needs and craves meaning, craves achieving something of reality. But there's many secular people who do say, oh, I'm, I have free will, or at least will accept it de facto, because that's how the criminal justice system works, and that's how they hold up their friends to account and colleagues to account. I think the word de facto is an important one, because we operate on different levels. And as a society, philosophical ideas take a long time to trickle down into, into the consciousness of how we all operate. And we're often able to live as bifurcated beings who, who, who sort of philosophically don't really understand or believe in free will, but on a pragmatic level justify the criminal justice system or relationships without actually questioning things. The truth is most of us just aren't philosophers, and all of us really aren't philosophers. We operate on a certain level philosophically, and much of the time we just get on with our lives, we have the busy pace of life, perhaps don't question. But if we've got a philosophy that's being pushed, and it's being pushed even by popular thinkers and popular authors, some of the new atheists and, and, and the genre of literature that they're now writing, they're pushing a... a philosophy, that if the implications of the philosophy become widely accepted, and if it trickles down into our consciousness, and, and ideas do trickle down into our consciousness. Think about how some of the ideas, for example, of Freud, have trickled down into our consciousness and, and, and affect the whole way we view the world, in many ways, in a positive way. If some of these new ideas trickle down into our consciousness, to my mind, they, they question the very premise on which civilization and the, the functionality of society operate. And to me, when I see students, and, and students late teens, the university years, do take philosophy seriously often. And they, they, they have the luxury of being able to engage in long philosophical uh, conversations before the, uh, the, the pragmatic, practical reality of life often kicks in. Students often question, they question the possibility of absolute morality. They question the possibility of them being able to choose freely. And, and if they think through the implications of that, this does begin affecting the practical, real-world decisions that are made. And to my mind, it begins questioning the very essence of what it means to be a human being and the very premise and basis on which our society has lives and operates. And um, 
the ethic that's informed the Western world, the Judeo-Christian ethic, the ethic that's informed how we operate, is one that's important. It's one that, that has allowed human beings to flourish and civilizations to flourish, not always successfully, very often unsuccessfully, that's true, but it's one that gives, allows us the possibility of meaning and the possibility of at least exploring and accepting that there might be a side to ourselves that's spiritual, that seeks meaning, that spirit, seeks a relationship with God, that, streets, that seeks genuine relationships, that seeks the possibility of souls being able to touch and... and, and the possibility of us giving altruistically to others. But if we question and deny the possibility of genuine altruism, if we question and deny the possibility of genuine meaning, if we question and deny the possibility of moral and absolute morality, or free will and free will freely chosen, then I don't know where that leaves a human being, and I don't know where that leaves society, but and that worries me. But don't most people just not think about those things? And they will make meaning for themselves. They'll find a purpose. They'll, through uh, human relationships, they will, uh, you know, find... Fulfillment. So most people really aren't grappling with these issues. So does it really matter? I, th I think, again, that's true. And, and as I said, people don't always bring philosophical ideas into their daily lives. I'm certainly not here. I'm certainly not arguing here that people can't make meaning for themselves. In fact, in Judaism, part of Judaism does demand of us to make meaning for ourselves. And part of meaning is indeed relationships. But if you think through the philosophical implications of mm -hmm. denial of free will, or denial of morality, then it does call into question the, the reality of any relationship. Because ultimately, a relationship re remains one in which we're both in it for ourselves. We're simply algorithms playing out the, the logic of that which is pre-programmed within us, and part of that which is pre-programmed within us is the realization that we can get greater pleasure in life if we're able to uh, use other people in, 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 for our own needs. And using other people isn't a great basis for a relationship. It's not really a possible basis for a relationship. And ultimately, the whole of society is built on relationships, personal relationships, societal relationships, and relationships with ourselves most mm. profoundly. And if we are simply pre-programmed machinery, it makes an impossibility of a relationship with ourselves and with others. Mm. And that's worrying. I... I think I know, just intuitively, that it is wrong to kill, to steal. Do I need a book to tell me this? My, the question is, what exactly is the function of a holy book, like, like the Torah in, in our case? Um, you know, people say that you need these, you need God to tell you uh, that it's wrong to do this or it's right to do that, otherwise it's not right or wrong. But there are others who say, no, you can just intuitively know this. And we sort of almost feel that. So do we really need the Torah to tell us how to be good people? And do we need an authority to tell us what we intuitively know to be good or bad? It's a, it's a good question and a difficult one. And there's a lot to say on the topic. But broadly speaking, just to try and uh, uh, capture the idea in a few moments, First of all, Judaism does believe in morality, in absolute morality. It believes there are things that are wrong and right. And it believes that humans can access these things even without revelation, even without the giving of the Torah or, or right. some divinely given command. I mean, in fact, Judaism has expectations on humans, whether they are aware of the existence of the Torah or not. Um, Judaism has expectations on human behavior pre the giving of the Torah, pre the revelation at Sinai. Judaism criticized the generation of the flood for its uh, uh, treatment of each other's human beings. Pharaoh was wrong to enslave the Jewish people, whether he was aware of God as a giver of Torah or not. In fact, it took place before the giving of the Torah. So Judaism absolutely believes that there is a, a moral sense that we humans have, and that there is an absolute wrong and right uh, 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 that's out there, that, that exists. Now, but is that, are we accountable for it because we have that moral sense within us? And we are therefore accountable to because we have the moral standards. We, yes, we are accountable and expected to live up to certain moral standards. Now... Does that mean we must have, all have the same moral senses? Clearly, humans can disagree about these moral standards, and they can debate it, in the same way as there may be an absolute truth about, whether, about scientific reality, whether the moon is made of cheese or not is a scientific fact, even though the ability of humans to access that truth may, at least at certain periods in human history, be limited. Mm -hmm. So you can have debate about all sorts of issues in science. People can vigorously debate and bring evidence either way as to whether the world is flat or not, and they may not have had the ability to determine the answer to that at certain points in human history, but there was an absolute reality out there nonetheless. And therefore, we would look at the various moral debates that we question and that we argue over, and would say, 
there's a lot of things about which we are unclear in terms of the moral arena. And nonetheless, there are, at least in some situations, perhaps answers. It doesn't mean every situation is a clear-cut moral answer, but at least in principle, some moral situations have moral answers, whether we are easily able to access it or not. And we can strive and reach towards the truth. And sometimes reaching towards the truth can take generations of debate and, and controversy within the world of philosophy or the world of ethics and mor morality. But that doesn't mean to say that we're not capable as humans sometimes to ach achieve an answer upon which we will agree. So th this is point number one. I think that Judaism does recognize that and, and validates that. It's partly, actually, because there can be moral conundrums and moral questions which aren't always so clear, and it's not always so easy to find the answer, that we do need revelation. Sometimes there's a need for revelation to give us clarity as to a, the way to deal with a particular situation. Right. And sometimes there could be moral aspects and dimensions which aren't accessible to human intuition and to human insight and to human reflection. And this is where the world of spirituality comes from. So broadly speaking, we can look at certain of the mitzvot and certain of the anachot in the Torah and say that they're accessible, they're reasonable, our reason can access them and see the utility and morality inherent in them, such as murder and theft and other, other such matters. And then there can be ones which we call chok, we label as the areas of mitzvot where we don't necessarily understand the spiritual moral dimension to them. And yet nonetheless, God has revealed to us that this is something of importance and something of moral uh, morality inherent in this and an aspect of a human development and the spiritual flourishing of a human being that's important mm. in this commandment, in this mitzvah. I would also add that sometimes even the areas of more intuitive, obvious morality, such as murder or theft, one can push the question to the boundaries and again, human intuition and human insight can break down. And because of that, we have the various debates over the end of life issues, right. or the beginning of life, the debate and controversy about which stage a fetus becomes a human life, the debate and controversy over which stage is the end of human life, and therefore one can push moral dilemmas. One can think of moral scenarios in which you need to make a weighting between the value of human life versus other human needs, the various questions over the ethics of, of warfare, the ethics of using one life in order to save another life or many other lives. So one can push also the boundaries. And again, this is where revelation and halacha becomes important. Fine, I accept all that. But the basic idea of, let's say, do not kill mm. unnecessarily, do we need a book to tell us that? In Jewish thinking, the answer is no. We don't need a book to tell us that. There's an, so added, there's an added dimension in us being told so by God. Because in so doing, we're not just respecting other human life because of the value within other humans, but we're also res respecting the God-given element of human life, the fact that right. all of humans are created in the image of God. And therefore, someone shouldn't murder because they respect and recognize and value the humanity of another human being. And they also shouldn't murder because God has said not to murder, because every human being is a divine creature right. in, an, in their own right, carries within them the image of God. And therefore, there's another layer that's added by the additional so commandment that's given. when people say the only thing that makes it... So you get some religious people, certainly Christian people, you'll get some Christian people that will say that the only way that you can say that it's wrong to murder can be if you say that there's a God who said it's wrong. So you're saying that actually we don't necessarily need that. The, ex of the, 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 the evidence being that Judaism says that before the Torah was given, people were held to account for these things. And so you're just saying there's an, an, and we're held to account for that because we have the sort of the book within us that says that this is wrong. But the added dimension is God saying it, and it brings a new, new element to the, to the command. I'm not an expert in Christian theology, so I can't uh, comment on that. Um, I can say within Judaism, though, uh, yes, that's correct. We, we believe there's a moral dimension beyond the instruction of God at Sinai, the revelation of God. In fact, in many ways, you can turn it on its head. Part of the reason we need to listen, why ought we to listen to that which God commands, mm -hmm. is because of the moral element that's there. We owe God, one of the reasons for needing to listen to God is we owe God as the creator, as the one who's given us the gifts of life and our whole existence and the world within which we live. And therefore, there's a dimension of morality within this. Maybe make, let me make this a little bit clearer. Um, we often look at different societies and we see radically, seemingly radically different moral codes. That can perhaps lead us to question whether indeed there's agreement over even the premises of morality at all. Um, I would argue, though, that when we probe more deeply, very often they share there's a commonality between the basic premises of morality and simply their understanding the world in a different way. So, for example, we look at a society, some of the uh, uh, um, Central American civilizations that existed before the Spanish and uh, before the Spanish conquest. So, they would engage in child sacrifice, and you could look at that and seemingly say, well, clearly these pe are people who don't value human life in the same way as we yeah. do, and there may indeed be slight differences in the degree of value they place on human life. But at core, it's coming from a different understanding of the reality of the reality of the world, the scientific reality of how the world operates. Because if you believe, as they believed, that the sun isn't going to rise every day unless you slaughter a child in honor of the gods, then maybe you can justify this morally. 
not because you have a different moral code, but because you believe this is the only thing you can do in order to save right. the rest of everyone else's lives. Right. So sometimes the reality of how we see, the scientific reality of how we understand the world will affect the application right. of the same right. shared moral principles. Look, we live in a society in which we believe it's justified to allow a qualified human being to take a scalpel and cut open another human being, a child, in order to save their lives in a medical procedure. Right. If one day it turns out that we're mistaken about all our medical assumptions, vanishing un unlikely as it is, then it will turn out that that which we did was wrong. But that won't be because we had a different moral sense. So this new civilization has arisen that understands that actually doing operations is wrong. It's simply an application of the same moral principles to our understanding of the scientific reality of the world, which therefore justifies operating on a child, causing a child pain, because such pain isn't needless pain. Causing a child needless pain is morally wrong. Right. Causing a child pain in order to save their life is morally appropriate. But are there instances, for example, recently we've seen with uh, Nazism, that yes. you have societies that are actually saying, we want to banish our moral intuition. A person can choose to ignore their moral voice. Right. But Judaism places a trust in human beings. That it's there. A trust that it's there is a moral voice. You right. can choose to ignore it. And we all, by the way, we don't need to go as extreme as Nazism. And sometimes going extreme makes us, makes us miss a profound moral truth. Because we all experience this on a daily basis. Mm. The time when we're lying there, lazily playing on our phones, and we're aware that there's someone who needs us around the house to do some help. But we choose to ignore that little voice that's saying, is this really right what you're doing? Shouldn't you yeah. get off and get and do something? Yeah. So we all engage in experience of choosing to ignore our moral voice. There's the fact that we can ignore the moral... I don't want to use that line. <laughs> but um, we can choose to ignore the moral voice inside us. That doesn't mean that it doesn't, uh, that yeah. it doesn't exist. Yeah. The other point to mention, and I, I suppose this is a part of the element of the need for revelation, is we need to ensure that we've considered all the moral dimensions within which we operate. So for example, if I said to you about someone there, a great citizen, they're a good father, a good spouse, a good husband, great brother. Mm. Um, does that make them a good person? Mm. And the answer would be, well, have I checked through that they've covered, they've ticked all the moral boxes? Mm. Maybe they're great and good in all these respects, but they're not a good son. Mm. So Judaism, again, is making the claim you can be a good person, you can be a moral person, in all sorts of dimensions. But one of the relationships that's important to us and that we need to acknowledge is the relationship with God. Mm. And therefore, part of being a good and moral person, again, is to take into account that relationship. The facts and how you understand the world will influence the sort of moral decisions you take. And their revelation, which is part of our, the source of our knowledge that there is a God, mm. and the fact that this God cares about some of the things we do as human beings, mm. and again, it's a deeper discussion about why he cares, that itself influences the moral equation, and therefore makes that part of what necess is necessary for us to be moral human beings. We need to be good sons, good spouses, good parents, but also good and obedient in our relationship with God. That's part of what it means to be a good person. Thank you for joining us today and listening to JTV Podcasts. You can find more podcasts from JTV, including interviews with Rabbi Manus Friedman, Dennis Prager, Rabbi Dr. Akiva Tatz, and many more, available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Just search for JTV Podcasts with Oli Hannesfeld. Don't forget to subscribe on the JTV YouTube channel for hundreds of videos on Jewish philosophy, Israel, Jewish wisdom, and much, much more. Please consider supporting us so we can continue to grow. Just visit paypal.me forward slash JTV channel. Thank you for listening and have a wonderful day.